Cindy's done a great presentation talking about uh, desire, so I'm not going to go too much into details about the description of desire, but it's really about um, really now thinking differently about uh, uh, clients coming for too much desire. Uh, as a sex therapist and you know maybe a psychotherapist in general, a lot of people um, you know come for low sexual desire, as Cindy was saying, uh, self-diagnosed low low sexual desire, and actually another big group of population comes to therapists because they worry about too much uh, desire, which is also self-diagnosed. So just a little bit of background about me. I'm a psychosexual and relationship psychotherapist. I'm a, a trauma therapist as well. I do EMDR and I do supervision. I work with individuals and couples. Uh, so my background is very much sex relationship, but also trauma informed. So in terms of too much desire, first uh, we'll be looking at uh, what it actually means when people say too much desire, what it means for our clients, but also what it means for us. You know, how do we think of that for ourselves? Um, and also uh, thinking about uh, when, what, what are actually the, the problems when people say too much desire? Again, you know, it's self-diagnosed. It can be quite vague. What could actually be the problem? Is it desire? Is it arousal? Is it fantasies? Or are people actually talking about behaviors? So just in a nutshell, uh, in terms of desire, uh, you know, Cindy uh, talked about it a lot, so I'm not going to go too much into details about that. But broadly, when we talk about desire, we talk about um, uh, having, feeling a strong sexual attraction to some, somebody or people, a strong feeling to want to have sex with somebody or some people, a strong feeling of wanting something so it doesn't necessarily is about sex it could just be uh, about other things we can desire chocolate for example very much and so the desire is really understood as a, a feeling state um, as cindy was saying is very much psychological it's mood driven arousal on the other hand is more about the physiology part of it so it's the what we call sexual excitement but we can feel that in the body um, there is uh, a strong, uh, it's causing strong feelings of excitement. So again, sometimes arousal comes before desire. A lot of people think desire comes before arousal, uh, but actually it could be the other way around. It's a physiological change. So often the blood will go into uh, parts of the body like the penis or the clitoris, and we can actually feel the physical, the physiological change. Fantasies is um, thinking about something pleasant, either something pleasant that is unlikely to happen. It's a really good way to take ourselves to other places. It takes imagination. Um, and sometimes it's story-based, narrative-based to uh, describe events that are different from real life. So sometimes it can be unlikely things to happen. And other times it can be some things that could happen, but isn't happening right now in real life. And it's um, a really good way to, uh, to really, you know, take ourselves to different places where our life is just a little bit, um, you know, daily grind. And actually at the moment, in terms of COVID, I imagine a lot of more people are going to start to fantasize about simple things like going out um, unlimited amount of times or going to the shop and finding, you know, the right food. Now, behaviors is, uh, again, something different. Behaviors is actions that people take. And that means it takes decision. And that's actually really, really important. Although it might appear to be quite common sense, uh, talking about it now, it's actually um, important to remind our clients and sometimes to remind ourselves because um, a lot of the time people say, oh, uh, my sexual desire is out of control and my sexual behaviors are out of control and I don't have, I, I don't know how to, to manage this. And in fact, a lot of the behaviors that we have, although they can feel out of control, they are under our decisions. We are making choices. Although uh, if it's unconscious choices, we, it feels like we're not making the choice, but we are making the choice. It is often situational, uh, our behaviors, you know, deciding um, to be sexual, uh, to have a sexual behavior or not, uh, is situational. So again, when people say, you know, I'm out of control uh, with my sexual behaviors, it's not always the case because 
uh, usually it responds to some kind of um, of environment. Uh, right now, again, in, in COVID time, perhaps our sexual behaviors uh, have changed. Either uh, much lower sexual behaviors because of the stress and anxiety of everyday life, but for some other people, the sexual behaviors might really be on the increase for uh, to respond to the same kind of environment. Now, another element of sexual desire and sexual behaviors in general, usually bring up sh shame. I'm sure we all know that. Um, but when we talk about too much sexual desire, it brings even more shame. And the problem with shame is that it is just toxic. And the more there is toxic shame, the more it creates problems. And actually this is the toxic shame that creates a lot of psychological problems, uh, in my opinion. But shame is also uh, isolating because the more shame there is, the less we're likely to talk about it. And a lot of our clients will be coming to us full of shame. And actually, just by the fact that they've arrived in the room in the initial consultation, um, you know, we have to validate that because so many more people will not arrive in our room because of the shame. And also people feeling a lot of shame about their sexual desire or their sexual behaviors um, will not speak to other people about it. And they will just keep it all to themselves. And then, and then the more they keep it to themselves, the more they think, oh gosh, it's so bad and I'm so wrong, the, the more the, the toxic shame increase. And so of course the toxic shame, the, the language of the toxic, toxic shame is I'm bad. They're you know, taking one maybe feeling state, sexual arousal element of themselves, and then they start to generalize it into who they are as people. And often it goes to, I am bad, or I am wrong, or I am broken. Um, so amongst the people of the LGBTQ community, this is really, really common because of the heteronormative world that we live in. Um, this is, so so common, we're, we're so used to it. But actually also in the heterosexual world, um, a lot of people are feeling also a lot of shame because of what they read online and because of all those different forums that people go onto as soon as they start to question their sexual desire or their sexual behaviors in terms of too much. They Google that and what they get is just pathology after pathology after pathology. And that creates, that increases shame for everybody. Now, when, uh, you know, thinking about that then, we have to think about whether the problem is too much desire or is it too much shame? So people feel shame with their sexual desire, arousal, fantasies and behaviors because people, uh, you know, the, the common narrative that we have in the world today is um, you should be monogamous and be happy with just one person, having really loving sex, looking into each other's eyes and that should be it really. And so people that fall outside of that small little box, which is I would say quite a lot of people, uh, then we'll start to think, oh, I'm not that, therefore I am wrong. And so um, what I see a lot in my clinical practice is people having huge amount of shame because of having a high sex drive or because they watch pornography or because they have multiple lovers or because they have anonymous sex or because they have unusual fantasies or because they have unusual kinks, or because they choose to be in consensual non-monogamy. Now, all of that often, uh, people will not talk about this out there. You know, we, we don't see so much, uh, you know, so many people out there saying, um, you know, on Facebook and social media, or even in social gathering, when we could do social gathering, um, hey, hi, you know, yes, this is, this is what I'm gonna do this weekend. I'm going to do this really unusual kink. No, you know, people say, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go drinking this weekend. I'm gonna go to the restaurant this weekend. I'm gonna try uh, budging jumping this weekend, but nobody says, you know, I'm gonna dress up in latex and, you know, have a great time with porridge. So um, one way that I'd like to think about or that I'd like to help my clients um, about thinking of desire differently is to get them to understand how the, the mind and especially the cognition mind works around that. 
uh, and that's uh, and there is a particular type of therapy that we call metacognitive therapy. It belongs to you know it, it's, it's very uh, you know cognition based. I don't only use cognition based therapy, but I think for this uh, to for at the beginning to start to help clients thinking differently about it, um, I think it's helpful. And one of the things that um, in metacognition that we'll talk about is the desire thinking part of cognition. So the metacognitive therapy is really is, is the theory about the belief that we put on thought. So we have a feeling and then we have an original thought and then often we don't stop at the original thought, then we just put extra thoughts onto, onto that one to get away from our emotions in the first place. And that's what we call the thought, uh, the so the thought and event fusion. So uh, an example of a thought event fusion is the plane will fall, right? So we have the first uh, um, feeling that we might have is anxiety, and then we just think, oh, the first thought is, oh, I'm afraid that uh, of flying, and then we can put a lot of other thoughts about this to say, oh, the plane will fall definitely, and that's and that's the end of my life, and so on and so on, and blah blah blah, and then that's when. Uh, the, the, the thoughts then become, um, uh, goes into different stories that are so far away from the initial element of anxiety. So the, the metacognitive therapy is aiming to help letting go of the control of, of our mind because when we put too many thoughts on top of the original thought or the original feeling, it's an attempt for us to try to control, um, to feel like we're in control of our emotion and we're in control of our mind. And so the theory is more like, kind of like, you know, you can let go of the control because it's gonna be okay. No matter how much you worry, things are still gonna happen the way it does. And at the moment with COVID, we're quite challenged with that, right? So the desire thinking is really the, the a voluntary thinking. It's a decision that we make to think about something that is uh, originally positive. When we, you know, now we're talking not about the plane falling, we're talking about uh, sexual desire. So we have, we might have first a sexual desire. Um, and then when we feel the sexual desire, we have the original thought that could be, oh, I quite like to have sex today. And that's the first positive target thought which is uh, normal and great to have a comp you know, with the, the sexual desire. But what we do after that, a lot of the times, a lot of our clients do, is that they put other thoughts onto it. Oh gosh, I'm in a conference, I shouldn't be feeling sexual right now. What's wrong with me to feel sexual right now? I should be uh, working and I should be um, not feeling sexual because I should be really thinking about what I'm hearing right now in this conference. And you know, I must be so bad and so wrong. Oh gosh, I am out of control. And so then that's when we call rumination the what is and why am I like this? Why do I think this way? Why do I feel this way? I should not be feeling this way right now. And the rumination goes into then a generalized worry, uh, which is all my thoughts and feelings are bad and wrong, and then toxic shame follows. So this is really the kind of things I tell my clients just to just as psychoeducation to start with so that they can really um, start to understand some of their thought process. You know, activating event, feel sexual desire. Then you feel sexual arousal, perhaps in the, in, in the physiological sense. And you might have some fantasies that come with that. And the first original desire thinking, I wish I could have sex right now. Then comes the rumination then comes the worry. And that's when you can get into um, distress. Now, the antidote to that is what we call uh, mindful observation. And that goes something like this. I'm feeling horny right now. I'm enjoying this deeply human experience and I will return to my spreadsheet in a minute. Now, it's easy for us to say now, but when you're in the throes of shame, it's a lot harder to really do the mindful observation. So it takes practice, but you can really uh, help your clients uh, with that and, you know, teaching them the mindful observation and encourage them to practice. Now, another thing um, that is quite common, uh, a common conversation in my clinical practice is objectification. So that is a loaded word usually. And people think it's uh, bad and horrible to objectify others. 
And in fact, objectification can be bad if it's uh, uh, in one of the definition of it is to use a person's body part for your own sexual gratification and denying their humanity. So, of course, if you do that, or if your clients do that, that can be, you know, problematic, and you know, uh, uh, and to have to really address that. However, it doesn't mean that all objectification is bad because objectif objectification is not just this one definition. There's many other parts of objectification. And um, I don't know about you, but what I find is that objectification is quite gender biased. So the discourse is usually about uh, men objectifying women that is quite bad, but women objectifying men is not so bad in, in, for some reason. And well, for some reason, of course, we know why, because um, you know, there's more violence perpetrated against women. So the uh, men objectifying women is a lot more, uh, feels a lot more dangerous. But if we think about, you know, if you look at this photo, if you think about objectification, sometimes it's totally accepted like the uh, Diet Coke model. And, you know, when you think of Diet Coke models, everybody agrees that it's okay to objectify this man. And I'm pretty sure that nobody wants to be very curious about um, his personality. So, um, Dr. David Lay, on one of his books, I think is The Myth of Sex Addiction, wrote uh, that objectification is not good, no bad, it just is. And objectification can be useful for some people. For example, if uh, you're a surgeon and you need to cut up somebody's bodies to do an operation, it's a good idea to objectify that body and not think about their feelings at the time, otherwise that might just uh, prevent you from being a surgeon. But it can also be necessary and helpful for lovers to enhance the sexual desire and the sexual arousal if there is an issue with that. And, you know, as Cindy was talking about it in the first place, is to say, you know, what are the conditions to uh, uh, enhance your sexual desire? And actually, some of it could be the uh, objectification. Um, but objectification is also a really good way to really receive pleasure that somebody gives you or pleasure to yourself because when you are relaxing into your body, at that moment, receiving sexual pleasure for somebody else means that you have to really focus on your own body parts and maybe not always considering in that one moment about what your partner is feeling. And objectification, like we can see with the Diet Coke model, can be hot sometimes and bring some uh, welcome sexual desire and sexual arousal. So for us, I'd like us to really think about what it means uh, when we talk about sexual desire in the context of too much sexual desire. Um, what sex positivity is, okay? Because um, it seems that in the world of sex therapy and maybe uh, psychotherapy, sex positivity is one of those buzzwords at the moment that everybody talks about, right? So it's very much like you go to uh, lots of sex, sex therapist website or psychotherapist website, and often you see, I am sex positive, I am sex positive. But when I supervise a therapist or when I hear about clients' past therapy experience, um, what it seems to be happening is that people write the word, I am sex positive, but they don't actually practice it. And in order to be sex positive, you have to kind of um, uh, have a, a philosophy. Sex positivity is not really what we do. It's a philosophy that we have to adopt for ourselves and actually really believe, almost like, you know, believe in a passionate way. Otherwise, we're not really sex positive. Right. And so I think, uh, so you've got the description here on, on the slides. I hope you can read. I'm not going to read it all, but um, there is, you know, some uh, important elements of sex positivity. And uh, this is uh, taken from Justin Lemeler, uh, one of the sex researchers in America. And if you really look at this list of what sex positivity actually is, then you can start to think about um, when people say, oh, uh, too much sex uh, is wrong, or too much sexual desire is wrong, or um, people start to diagnosing or, or even discussing uh, concepts like sex addiction, for example, then as soon as you start to have this kind of narrative with yourself as a clinician, but also with your clients, you are actually moving away from sex positivity. Now, 
it's okay if you want to be working with different framework, but I think it's important for yourself first and for your colleagues, but also for your clients to really do what you put on your team. And this is one of the things. So now with too much desire, what is our bias? Because, you know, we could be sex positive uh, and really truly sex positive, but also we're human and we might have some reaction sometimes to some particular words or some particular sexual practice. So I've put a few here just for you to just have a look at for, for a moment. And I'd like you to, those are just a very few words amongst many others, but I'd like you to really think about what comes up for you when you see those words. Uh, when you see those words right now, for example, come dump or um, bareback, BDSM, queen, camp, slut. And when you think about that for you, I'd like also for you to think about what comes up for you when you hear those words from your clients. What do you do with that? What do you do with that language? Some people can easily think that cum dump means uh, out of control sexual behaviors or that it could mean too much, too much sexual desire, for example. So when can desire, when can we describe desire being too much? Well, it is really subjective. And it is subjective because in the ICD-11, there is no normative sexual behaviors. And so what it means is that when we think of too much sexual desire, too much sexual behaviors is not actually a, a diagnosable thing according to the ICD-11. There is no normative sexual behaviors and there is no normative amount of sexual desire or uh, sexual arousal. So it's all up to us. But some people can feel distressed with uh, feeling too much sexual desire. And my question for you would be, is it too much sexual desire or too much shame? And I think it's really important to really inquire what is underneath the distress of feeling too much sexual desire. Now, uh, uh, one of the new uh, research published this year is from uh, Grubbs, who says that people with religious views are more likely to self-perceive with porn addiction. And, and, in, and actually, people with religious views are more likely to uh, think that their sexual desire or their sexual behavior is wrong or, th or that there's a problem with it. Now, it also uh, applies to therapists uh, who, have sex, who have religious views that therapists are more likely to pathologize somebody who describes too much sexual desire without inquiring further about what's underneath than people who are sex positive. And another study, much older study, uh, which I think is quite interesting and goes quite well with the study uh, this year, is a study that was done with chocolate. And what the study found is that the more people try to stop thinking about chocolate, the more they were likely to have a behavior that was eating chocolate. So uh, that, that's, that's, I think that's quite interesting because, uh, I mean, we can also see that now in, in, in COVID time, how, um, you know, not being able to get what we want, perhaps suddenly we have this strong sexual, uh, sorry, this strong uh, desire, food desire for this juicy cucumber that we can't find on the shelves anymore. And when there was plenty of cucumbers, we just never bought it, right? So, you know, if you think about, oh gosh, I've, I've got to stop thinking about sexual desire. I've got to stop feeling sexual desire. Actually, you're probably more likely to uh, have, uh, to engage in, in, in sexual behaviors. So that's quite interesting. Now, the problem with too much sexual desire can be that people can struggle with impulse control. So impulsive, you know, we're all impulsive in some ways, like we can be impuls impulsive eating chocolate or, um, you know, whatever else, but uh, some of us are more, uh, find it easier to control our impulses than others. It can be trauma. It can be shame, as we've talked about earlier, moral views that we've just talked about now. 
Um, and sometimes, and very often, it's just mismatched values. Somebody thinks they have too much desire because they happen to be with a partner who has less sexual desire, and somehow is the partner with too much sexual desire that, uh, seems, that would say they have the problem. So uh, I'm just running out of time, but I just want to uh, really uh, briefly talk about impulsivity and compulsivity, because when we talk about impulsive, uh, impulsive control problem, Impulsivity is not always the problem because when you're impulsive is when the impulsivity, the role of impulsivity is to increase arousal and increase thrill. So often it's just really about enhancing something in your daily experience. Whereas compulsivity is about moving away from tension, moving away from something unpleasant. So one is going towards something pleasant and the other one is moving away from something unpleasant. And often compulsivity is the thing to really uh, address rather than impulsivity. And when you look at compulsivity, don't look at the behavior of the compulsivity, look at what's underneath. And often underneath, it will be a, a chronic stress issue. And the chronic stress can be anything in people's lives. So again, going back to what we talked about earlier in terms of um, environment, you know, we, our sexual desire responds to the environment. And if the environment is not uh, so good, there's a deficit in the environment, we can have either increased sexual desire or decreased sexual desire. So it's good to look at the chronic stress in terms of compulsivity. So things that we do with the things that I do with my clients is mindful observation, as uh, we've talked about earlier. Distraction is another one. It has to be active, enjoyable, and realistic distraction. So watching uh, TV endlessly is not a good distraction. That's not going to help you with regulating your urges or, or self-regulating your emotions. But if you watch a documentary on Netflix that you're really interested in, then that is an active, enjoyable um, distraction. And the four elements of self-regulation is earth, air, water, and fire. Uh, that's a, a trauma-informed uh, self-regulation. Earth is grounding uh, with your feet on the, on the ground. Air is breathing. Uh, like Cindy was saying earlier, breathing is such an important part of self-regulation. Water is less known. Uh, water is about salivating. If you self-salivate, uh, it activates the nervous system and cal calms it down. And with sexual um, desire, that's an important part. Because if people feel a high sexual desire, but at the same time they have a dry mouth, it means that they are actually in a trauma space rather than a natural uh, sexual desire that goes into sexual arousal. Um, so if you, if you uh, help clients self-salivate either by themselves or with a glass of water, or even sucking on a sweet, a hard sweet, uh, that will actually uh, start to calm the nervous system down and moving away from a trauma reaction. And fire, what we mean by fire is an image. So that's visualization, you know, uh, finding yourself in a good place. That's also a good self-regulation. I don't have time to uh, talk about the case study, but you can just read the case study. That's one very small example of, of a kind of like a typical case study of somebody who has, uh, who complains about high sexual desire. Um, please read it in your own time. And if you have any questions about this, um, don't hesitate to contact me. So really what we are saying here today is that uh, thinking about too much sexual desire is subjective and it's often a, a shame response. Desire is not defunctional. How we ruminate about it is, could be the problem. Controlling impulses depends on our emotional regulation skills and unresolved trauma. And objectification can be a great vibrant source of the erotic. If you have any questions, please do uh, email me or call me. Uh, or you can also follow me on social media. I'm always happy to help and always happy to answer your questions. And for your uh, groups, these are the questions. So for you to really think about um, how you're going to work with that. So how would you help someone who self-report having too much sexual desire, given you know, what, what is your original training, but also what you're learning today? And what is the difference for you um, about too much desire and too much sex? You know, how can you make the difference for you clinically and to help your clients with? And in one way, in what way um, can too much desire be a real problem or is it ever a real problem? So I'd like you to really reflect on that, think about that and talk to yourselves, uh, amongst yourselves about that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
So I am putting you into your groups now just as a 